Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to wait a few minutes uh, just to start so that a few more people can hop on. All right, let's get started. Welcome again to Amber's CE lecture series, Educate Next. I'm Jessica Gage, your moderator for today. I'm a certified genetic counselor here on our specialty genomic science liaison team at Ambry. Today, we are very pleased to have a panel of three speakers presenting on evaluating the family after sudden death in the young. We will hear from Mary Hardy's RN, Dr. Mary Shepard, MD, and cardiovascular pathologist, and Dr. Michael Ackerman, MD, PhD. This webinar is presented in partnership with the SADS Foundation. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to take care of. So just some reminders first, some of our automatic emails may arrive in your junk email folder, so please add us to known senders. Only the live sessions qualify for CEUs. So in order to obtain CEU credit, you must attend through the GoToWebinar link and complete the survey at the end of the webinar. Unfortunately, a call only connection does not appear on the attendance report, so you won't be able to claim CEUs going that route. Certified genetic counselors can be awarded 0.1 category one CEUs and one contact hour per webinar viewed live. This will occur at the end of the series in December. With this in mind, we recommend registering for Educate Next with your personal email just in case you change jobs. Please provide your NSGC user ID number on the survey. And for licensed CLSs, one case certificate is awarded per session. These are available about four weeks after the session. Please keep track of your participation to verify that the CEUs earned are correct. If anyone has any questions about any of this, please email educatenext at ambrygen.com. And just a few logistics as well. You were automatically muted in the webinar, and this session is being recorded. The recording will be available afterwards on the Ambry website. The control panel appears on the right side of your screen. From the grab tab outlined in blue here, you can hide the control panel view the webinar in full screen. And you can also answer questions in the questions pane, which is outlined in yellow here. Um, you can uh, submit questions at any time, but questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. After the presentation, when you close the window, our post-session survey will pop up in a web browser. It's also sent by email about one hour after the presentation. It will not ask for your name uh, because you are already logged in with that name that you used during the presentation. So please complete the survey soon after the webinar if you are included on the attendees report when we download it. If you are calling in only, you will not receive the survey by email. You must join through the link as well. And before we start our presentation, here are the speaker's disclosures. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Mary Hardy. Mary is a registered nurse for community mental health. Mary and her husband had four children, two boys and two girls. The loss of two of their children began the Hardy's family journey with long QT syndrome type two and genetic testing. Hello, our cardiac genetic journey started with the death of my son, Ethan. 
um, in 2002. Um, as far as anything that would have made us think he had a cardiac issue, he occasionally complained of some chest pain, just random. And also he had asthma, so he'd talk about his heart pounding intermittently, things that I thought were probably related to his albuterol that he would take on occasion when he needed um, some relief from the asthma. And uh, the day that he died, he had been playing football the night before. It had been hot and humid. Um, and he was just fatigued. He didn't really have any complaints, but he did have to take the inhaler more than usual that night. Um, I didn't think anything about it the next morning. He was up early, uh, so he was still tired, but he had gotten up early with his sister Esther to go um, whitetail hunting um, at the back of our property by our barn. And they were at an elevated blind and they had been hunting for a couple of hours when he told his sister to head down, they were gonna go back home. And she got just about to the bottom of the deer blind um, and she heard the gun discharge and Ethan was already falling off the side of the um, stand. Uh, the unusual thing about that was Esther said he never made any noise. He never hollered, he never yelled out. Um, other than the discharge, she had not known to look up. Uh, the coroner's report was accidental gunshot, um, but the sheriff's department, when they did a um, check of the bullet traje trajectory, noted that he must have already been either falling or leaning way over in order for the bullet to have actually hit him. Um, but again, it was considered accidental, um, nothing, that alerted anybody to looking um, anywhere farther than that. Five years later, however, on Christmas morning, um, my daughter Heidi was nursing her five week old son. And it was again early in the morning, about eight o'clock in the morning and the phone rang and her husband was in the other room and he heard the baby cry and he heard Heidi fall. Um, and of course the trigger was the phone and he started to do CPR right away. He thought maybe she had hit her head because she was unresponsive. But by the time EMS got there, they did get her heart restarted, but she had had to been um, defibrillated five times at that point. She suffered um, an oxic brain injury. And so everything shifted to caring for the brain injury and nobody ever really looked into why. However, about 12 hours, when she was in ICU that first day, she did have a torsades event. She was well over 600, um, but they said that was probably related to the heart injury just from trying to get her restarted that day. Um, but she was sent to a neuro unit in our state and um, there was they were trying to help us find out why she would have had this kind of an event. And we received a note from a nurse um, probably about a week before she was going to be discharged to a long-term care unit, stating that we needed to look into long QT. Um, the cardiologist at that um, area had been called and thought that it was a cardiac origin. So, but at that point, again, we were in a state, we had a new baby, we had a lot of things going on. So about a week after that, when she was transferred to long term care unit, I did contact the SADS Foundation because when I Googled it, that's what came up. And um, I got a live person that night. I relayed our family's story and our journey and the death of our son. And they said they thought that it was all interconnected and they gave me information on getting the genetic testing done, which we were able to get done within the next 24, 48 hours. Um, Heidi ended up dying about four hours, four days after we had obtained that blood sample, and she turned out to be long QT type two. Um, and subsequently, we all were tested, um, and we ended up with long QT in our family. Uh, there was multiple life changes that you have to take, um, taking medication on a routine basis. Uh, things like avoiding startles and dehydration. And we farm, we're a very active family. So a lot of those things um, took some concentrated effort. We also live in a very rural area. So trying to get our healthcare providers in our area um, 
to come up to speed on the condition was new as well. Um, we had some that did not want to treat us at the time uh, just because they were afraid of it. And they admitted that they didn't know anything about it. And um, thanks to a, our electrophysiologist, um, Dr. Bradley from the U of M, he was gracious and came and gave um, informational topics to our EMS services in the area, as well as our hospital and some of our doctors. Uh, that has improved over the years, um, especially because we still live in the area. Um, my family has ended up getting married. We've had children and grandchildren, so maternity care was an issue. Um, letting people feel safe doing shared care while they delivered at a bigger university hospital. Um, we still have to go locally to our local providers. Um, but again, that has improved over um, the subsequent years. Um, in my family, there I had four children. It appears that all four were probably positive. They, um, they said that Hunter's, at, or I'm sorry, Ethan's accident was probably, he had probably already had the torsades event and that's why he was falling over. That's why the trajectory of the bullet appeared to be what it was that he was already going over and that's why Esther never heard him make a noise um, that he had probably already um, gone over at that point. So out of my four children, it looks like all four were positive. Um, my oldest daughter, Heidi, um, her son, Hunter, was positive. I am positive. My son, Adam, and Esther, their family are coming up. They each have had one child that has been positive. Um, and again, I've already talked about beta blockers and avoidance of drugs. We use qtdrugs.org. We're real diligent, diligent in making sure that medications that um, are prescribed are not on that list. Um, our electrophysiologist has been more than um, willing to talk to providers if they've needed to put me um, medications on that were questionable. He will field their calls and give them um, suggestions. Um, Esther, who's a picture is right here, has traveled um, to Africa. And so some of the uh, medications that she needed to do that traveling, he also um, assisted us with. Um, and this is my son, my grandson Hunter in the middle and he is positive and myself, my son Adam and uh, this older boy, Connor, he is also positive. And my daughter Esther and her family and the little girl Weston, she is positive as well. Um, and that is our journey. I've been very thankful for SADS being able to direct us. Um, so quickly and able to get the genetic testing that we needed. Um, and again, as we go forward, it seems like we're getting better response um, from the medical community. The younger um, physicians seem to have a really good handle on it. I notice now when you do sports in Michigan, especially um, the SADS qualifications or the criteria for ruling out SADS conditions are now on the forms. So all of that has been a positive. Uh, thank you for letting me share. Thank you very much, Mary. I'd now like to introduce Professor Mary Shepard, Head of Cardiovascular Pathology in the Cardiovascular Sciences Research Center at St. George's Medical School at University of London. Mary does research in cardiac pathology with a specific interest in sudden cardiac death. Mary runs a national referral center in the United Kingdom for pathologists seeking an expert opinion on a cardiac case. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you. I will. I will. Just two seconds. I'll just go to my first slide. Yes, that's my first slide, yes. People see it? Um, I think you're at the end still of the presentation. Oh, there you go, yep, we're at the first yes, slide. Yes, that's there. Thank you very much. I think Mary's story brings out the traumatic effect of sudden death within the family. And I'm here as a cardiac pathologist from the United Kingdom where I have a special interest in the investigation of sudden death from the pathology point of view, the autopsy 
and the findings at the autopsy, which are of tremendous importance to both the cardiologist and to the family and their medical experts as well. So I'm based at St. George's Hospital. And in England, we have over half a million deaths per year. And what is very good for our system is that all sudden deaths are reported to the coroner. He is the medical examiner. And we have 94,000 autopsies per year, which is 17% of all deaths. We have an extremely high rate of autopsy, which is a good thing when it comes to the investigation of sudden death. So all sudden deaths, which are unexplained, as Mary already said to you, acute rapidly fatal illness, instantaneous deaths, where the attending physician cannot give a cause of death, where people are brought in dead into hospital, and deaths under unknown circumstances, where somebody literally is found dead in bed or found dead out in the street or the community. Now, I became interested because of Mike Davis, who was my predecessor here at St. George's, and we looked at a survey of sudden cardiac death in the United Kingdom in the 90s. And you can see here, not surprisingly, as we all know, the majority of sudden deaths of all age groups is IHD, which is ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, 82%. But what our study highlights, which I've here indicated, is SADS, sudden adult or sudden arrhythmic death, as we call it, making up 5%. In other words, these are cases where the pathologist does the autopsy and finds nothing and toxicology is also negative. And it was the first survey, first pathological survey, to highlight the entity of electrical abnormalities, what Mary's already described to you, the long QT syndrome and other syndromes, which Mike Ackerman will talk to you about. Now, ischemic heart disease is straightforward for the pathologist. You've got damage to the muscle of the heart, as you can see here, that's dark in color, meaning the heart muscle has died. And why is the heart muscle died? Because there's blockage below our coronary arteries, which should be open and full of blood as they should be here. But look, they're blocked by yellow lipid material, by atheroma. The majority of particularly open, older people die because of this. But we are dealing, as Mary has shown to you, younger people, totally different ballgame. But remember that young people can get coronary artery disease, as this case highlights, an 11-year-old. And the mother told us the family had familial hypercholesterolemia. So screening for this should be in anybody who has atheroma, lipid in the coronary artery under the age of 40. This is a common condition. We have over 110,000 in the United Kingdom. And the tragedy is that less than 25, a quarter, are diagnosed and treated. So they will present to the pathologist as early atheroma. So the pathologist needs to recommend that the family are screened and their cholesterol checked. Now, the role of the post-mortem. As we said, traumatic deaths, road traffic accidents, they're eliminated, obviously. And the pathologist at the autopsy will eliminate the non-cardiac causes, be it neurological like subarachnoid hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage, respiratory pathology, for instance, COVID-related pneumonia, which may occur, and obviously drugs are always important. Toxicology needs to be done and be negative. Now we go on to where the pathologist looks into the cardiac causes. Once he eliminates ischemic heart disease, I already mentioned to you, we look for the morphologically normal heart, what we call the sudden arrhythmic or sudden adult death cases, or else there is a cardiac abnormality, particularly a cardiomyopathy identified. So this is the role of the pathologist to detail these abnormalities. As Mike will tell you, there are many recent developments with a rapid evolution of genetic testing, particularly in the field of cardiomyopathies and the ion channelopathies. Now, we pathologists have guidelines. In my Royal College of Pathologists in the United Kingdom, which was written by me and by a fellow pathologist, Kim Suvarna, we have a scenario of a sudden death with likely cardiac pathology. 
And what's important, I want to highlight to you that when a sudden unexplained death occurs, close relatives are at potential risk of also having a fatal cardiac condition, as Mary has highlighted. So we emphasize that a standard post-mortem looking for the commonest causes of premature sudden death has been drawn up. Preservation of appropriate tissue if required for subsequent DNA. That's very important. Looking at the heart and preserving the tissue at autopsy for further genetic testing. Vitally important and our guidelines say this. We also have European guidelines with my colleagues in Europe emphasizing the same thing. Examine the heart and take material, be it heart or spleen or blood, that is capable of being extracted for DNA and being genetically tested. We are very lucky in the United Kingdom is that we have a UK national database that I get carts of people who have died suddenly from throughout the United Kingdom here at St. George's Hospital. And as a result of this, I will get the whole heart sent by a pathologist who has eliminated any other cause. In addition, the pathologist will send a small fragment from this organ, which is the spleen that is rich in DNA, and he will send this as well as the heart. And this is for the future genetic testing that Mary already discussed with you. Here in my cardiovascular department, I process the heart. What's important is all this is funded by families through the charity in the United Kingdom called CRY, similar to the SADS charity. I sample the heart extensively and I take blocks of tissue for histology. I will look at the left and the right ventricle. I will take photographs and I will look down the microscope at all this material and I will also store the spleen, which is freshly stored for genetic studies. Here are the blocks of tissue that are taken highlighted there, which can be preserved indefinitely. They can be preserved for over a hundred years, which is very important if they wish to be reviewed by families in the future. Now I have specific criteria, which I have developed in my department for the specific diagnosis of whether a heart is normal or abnormal. So I can diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, dilated cardiomyopathy, idiopathic left ventricular fibrosis, or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. I won't go into detail with you, but I have very strict guidelines because it is important for me to come to a diagnosis and establish a phenotype from the cardiac point of view at autopsy. In addition, I have a sudden cardiac death database in which I will enter the details of the history, the age, the sex, and the body weight of the patient. A previous family history of sudden death is very important. If there has been previous investigations of the individual, ECGs, echoes, etc., has there been previous imaging? I will do the heart weight, I will do heart measurements, I will take photographs, I will do histology, and then I will give a cause of death and send a letter out to the pathologist and the medical examiner. And this database is kept permanently for future research that we carry out here at St. George's Hospital. Now, I always tell pathologists to beware the normal looking heart, because just by looking at a heart with the naked eye, you may miss entities like cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, sarcoid, storage disease and fibrosis. So one always has to do histology as well as look at the heart with the naked eye. And over the process, we have built up 6,000 cases of sudden death since 1994. And you can see here that the majority of possible genetic etiology, which is of tremendous importance to the cardiologist looking after the family and the general practitioner also looking after the family. The majority of our sudden deaths are due to sad, sudden adult death, where the heart is morphologically normal, 44.5%. We still have ischemic heart disease here, even in a younger population, 15%. So familial hypercholesterolemia must be considered. Next is idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, 9.7% of our cases. Hypertrophic anemopathy make up 3.9%. 
and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy 3.6%, while dilated is 2.9%. These make up almost 75% of all our cases. In other words, three quarters have probably a genetic etiology, which is of tremendous importance to us all. In other words, we've got to be careful in establishing the diagnosis and expressing the phenotype at autopsy because the majority of entities are autosomal dominant with a one in two chance of the child being affected. There's also European recommendations integrating genetic testing into the multidisciplinary management of sudden cardiac death. And we have taken this on board. You can see here, this is a histogram of the cases I have received over the past seven years. And showing in red are the number of hearts I have received, rising from 310 in 2013 to 547 in 19. I already have 550 in 2020 and we're into November. But look at the amount of spleens, what has been taken genetically. It's been increasing exponentially since 2013. In other words, the pathologists are taking the material for future genetic testing in over half of our cases. A complete revolution from 2013 when very few cases were taken. So the message is going through to pathologists out there who are doing autopsies. So when you get a normal heart, and we've established the heart is normal and the toxicology is negative, then we're dealing, as already mentioned by Mary, with the inherited arrhythmia syndromes, long and short QT, Brugada syndrome, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, short CPVT, early repolarization syndrome, early idiopathic fibrillation, and progressive cardiac conduction disease, and inherited sinus node dysfunction. Michael will tell you more about these. But what's important is that there's mutations in these, in all of these, and a molecular autopsy, unfortunately, is infrequently utilized with monetary costs being put forward, particularly in Europe, as the, one of the main reasons for not doing this genetic testing at autopsy. And this is very important because look, it's increasing. And I'm telling you here, the spleens that we get, the genetic testing is funded by research. It is not funded by our NHS or by the general practitioners or by insurance companies. Our genetic testing is funded by the research. We have to strive now for funding to go through our National Health Service, which we are in the process of doing. A molecular autopsy, the yield of pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants in SADS, it's 13%, and in cardiomyopathies, 32%. But Michael will talk further about this. When I make the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as you see here, a thickened ventricle, and on the right shows histology showing what we call myocyte disorganization or disarray, and on below here is a dilated ventricle. In contrast to the thick wall, it's a thin wall, pale and thin with dilatation of the chamber, dilated cardiomyopathy. And on the right, you will see the yellow myocyte surrounded by pale pink collagen. On the histology, I will make the diagnosis of these two entities. This is an example of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, where fat, you can see yellow here, destroys and replaces the muscle of the myocardium, both the right ventricle and the left ventricle. In addition, we do histology to confirm the diagnosis. What about the entity I already mentioned, the idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy? This is where the heart is increased in weight. There's an increase in the wall thickness above 15 millimeters. There may be fibrosis highlighted here with paleness with no myocyte disarray. And I need myocyte disarray to indicate hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Very important message to get through to the medical people looking after. And we've already done a diagnosis of a small group of 46 families with idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy. And what we're seeing, not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutations, but mutations in 30% in the channelopathies, the Brugada syndrome, the long QT, WPW, and even in a minority, 
in DCM mutations and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy mutations. So the significance of this hypertrophy, is it linked to other cardiomyopathies, channelopathies, or is it simply a bystander? We're still evolving and combining the autopsy phenotype and genetic follow-up with clinical follow-up. So the approaches in an unexplained sudden death is familial evaluation by the cardiologist with an interest in inherited cardiac conditions and molecular autopsy with genetic testing of material taken at the time of the autopsy. This is invaluable for the diagnostic cause to be established. The role of the pathologist is to delineate clearly the phenotype at autopsy and to correlate with the cardiologist who does family follow-up and correlate also with genetic testing. The pathologist, I think, is an essential part of the multidisciplinary team looking after the family. The cardiologist with his expertise, the geneticist, the pathologist, with the specialist nurse, genetic counselor, GP and psychologist. All this is important in the approach to the family who suffered such a tragic event. Now, I'm glad to say in 2020, with the British Heart Foundation and NHS England, we are establishing five different places throughout the United Kingdom where every case of sudden cardiac death will be investigated with the taking of genetic material and genetic testing that will be paid for by the National Health Service going forward. Unfortunately, delayed, delayed now by the COVID virus, but we look forward to doing this next year. In other words, we will not be depending on charity or on research, but on the National Health Service so that everybody is entitled and gets a genetic testing, both at molecular level, at the autopsy, and the family members with cascading. I wish to acknowledge my cardiological colleagues Shanjay Sharma and Elijah Burr and Michael Papadakis. And finally, I want to emphasize that who we are really working for are for family like Mary's, the SADS Foundation and my own cry, cardiac risk in the young. And we need to speak to and communicate with these families. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Ackerman, a genetic cardiologist at Mayo Clinic. We're at the Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory. He studies genomics and genotype phenotype relationships in heritable cardiovascular diseases predisposing to sudden death. Dr. Ackerman's research interests include genomics, mutational analysis, and novel gene discovery related to the cardiac channelopathies. Dr. Ackerman will lead us in a discussion about what we've heard today and take questions for all of the presenters. Please submit questions in the question pane and feel free to direct your questions to a specific speaker if you'd like. Additionally, a link to a publication and some resources will be provided in the chat if you are interested in learning more. Well, Jessica, thank you so much. I couldn't resist everyone, the mask. Uh, you know, COVID-19, put it on, wear the mask. It's incredible though, isn't it, that we just had one of our states in our union, the United States, saying we now have to wear the mask in our home. So I thought I'd get ahead of things and put the mask on in my office with nobody here, uh, just in case it's circulating in the air. So we need to restore some sanity out there, everyone, but that's not the focus. Uh, Jessica and Ambry Genetics, thank you for uh, doing this and for inviting us and partnering with us at the SADS Foundation. So on behalf of Alice Laura, the CEO of the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome SADS Foundation, thanks to all 500 plus of you for, for joining us. And I wanna thank Mary with her family story. Out of tragedy, uh, she's doing uh, great things and knowing what is there now with the LQT2 uh, her children and grandchildren can live and thrive despite the diagnosis that tragically claimed two of her children. I wish we would have been smarter sooner. And as Dr. Mary Shepard, thank you to her, as she showed you, we are getting smarter and, and we want to take your questions now. So let's start a conversation 
during the next 20 minutes. I'm not gonna give you slides. You've seen some great slides. I wanna give you a couple of observations though, as we deal with the evaluation of the deceased, the sudden cardiac death victim, which nobody does it better than Dr. Shepard. And as we deal with the evaluation of the decedent's surviving relatives or family members, and as we deal with a sudden cardiac arrest survivor, we have several challenges out there that many of you are familiar with. And the challenges, uh, we could generate a long list, but just to get you thinking and start a conversation, they are as follows. And it would start with number one, capital letters, heterogeneity. There is tremendous heterogeneity across all levels. Heterogeneity one, in the quality of the autopsy. Whose eyes are staring at it? Are they Dr. Shepard's eyes at the autopsy material and through her microscope? Or are they the county coroner in the United States who might be a trained ophthalmologist but is assigned as the coroner? So the quality of the autopsy across the world is profoundly heterogeneous. In the United States, it depends on which county you die in as what will be the quality of that forensic assessment of that sudden death victim and the ability to identify true organic structural heart disease if it's indeed present. Will they see it by eye or by microscope? We have to improve on the heterogeneity. In the United States, the National Association of Medical Examiners has done a great job in trying to level the playing field and getting people up to speed. And like what Dr. Shepard has done, we at the Mayo Clinic, I serve as director of the Winland Smith Rice Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic and the Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory. And in partnership with our version of Dr. Shepard, Dr. Dr. Joe Malaszewski, we've created a resource for the comprehensive cardiac autopsy of the sudden death victim for any member of the National Association of Medical Examiners in the United States, where they can get a second opinion by eye, by microscope, and by DNA analysis of that sudden death victim. So we're trying to step in the gap and, and, and neutralize some of that tremendous heterogeneity about where you died. Second, the heterogeneity of the evaluation of the living. One, it ranges not only in who's the evaluator, but what is being done. And when somebody dies suddenly and we're left with the rest of the family, it ranges from barely condolences for the family in their time of profound grief to ordering every test under the sun and redoing it every year. And so to neutralize that extraordinary heterogeneity, there's some tremendous resources for you out there. Last year, uh, Belinda Gray, Eli Eliza ba Elijah Bear, Chris Simsarian, and myself, we put out a global approach to the evaluation of sudden unexplained death in the young in circulation, arrhythmia, and electrophysiology. And we're gonna provide that for you all. Then this year, Martine Stiles was our chair, Arthur Wilda, the co-chair, and we put out the first comprehensive international guidelines from the Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm Society, the Heart Rhythm Society, and the European Heart Rhythm Association as to what should be done for the deceased. Dr. Shepard dealt with all of that. What should be done for the deceased family members? And what should be done if you are a cardiac arrest survivor so that we stop doing just condolences and we stop ordering every cardiac test that we know how to order and ordering it every single year. Then third, many of you out there are genetic counselors. And last week, Genetic Counselor Awareness Week, thank you, you to my fans and my colleagues and to the experts in genetic counseling, you guys are really important. Unfortunately, there's not enough of you men and women in cardiovascular genetic counseling. And so there's tremendous heterogeneity in doing genetic testing when it should be done and, and then interpreting the results. So you heard Dr. Shepard say genetic testing, the molecular autopsy, which we pioneered and we released for the first time 
1999. So now 30, oh, let's see, what is that? That is like 31 years ago, um, 1999, 21 years ago, yeah. 21 years ago, the molecular autopsy, some people call it post-mortem genetic testing. It was research when we discovered it and when we used it to identify a genetic basis for structurally normal heart sudden death victims and showed what is the percentage that those may be channelopathic sudden cardiac death. And it's around 25%, give or take. That then from went from research to practice, but you saw from Dr. Shepard, it still is research in the United Kingdom. It still is not even research or anything in many parts of the world. It is standard of care. If a person dies suddenly and unexpectedly, and uh, Dr. Shepard can tell you why, cardiomyopathy X, Y, and Z, genetic testing is indicated for that decedent. If she cannot tell us why, and she's gonna call it autopsy negative sudden unexplained death, or SADS, genetic testing, the molecular autopsy, is clinically indicated. That's starting to be recognized in the United States. The guidelines make it clear that the genetic testing is indicated. So it's moved from 21 years ago discovery, started at Mayo Clinic as the molecular autopsy, to now clinically indicated molecular autopsy. That brings a new issue of heterogeneity, the quality of the interpretation of the genetic test result. Just because you find an RYR2 variant in a sudden death victim during sleep doesn't mean that you have figured it out as being due to catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or CPVT. The noise rate when nothing is found at autopsy increases when you do the genetic test. So yes, it's indicated, but we've got to be really careful I think there, there's one thing that's worse than telling a family, we don't know why your child died. The worst is telling them, we have found the reason, it's this genetic marker, and then we're wrong about it. So we have variants of uncertain significance that we have to deal with. We have findings of uncertain significance that Dr. Shepard has to deal with. She does many second opinions and you can see them where the original pathologist said it was X, and Dr. Shepard says, no, not so fast. That finding is an ambiguous finding at best. You're seeing things with your eyes. So lots of work we need to do. We do have guidelines now that we never had, so at least we know the roadmap to follow, but as we follow this roadmap, we have to be uh, tenacious in our detective work with our eyes, with our microscopes, and with sleuthing our genetic code. So I hope you have some questions to entertain for us. I'm gonna, Jessica's gonna have Mary come on and Dr. Shepard come on and the three of us in the balance of our 15 minutes would love to see what you guys are wondering about out there. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman. And uh, the in the chat function, the evaluation after sudden death in the young publication that Dr. Ackerman mentioned was shared. So please feel free to read that. Um, our first question is for Dr. Shepard. Um, the question is, does Dr. Shepard do broad panel molecular autopsy or disease targeted, broad panel molecular autopsy or disease targeted genetic testing depending on histology? Uh, good question. We, it's targeted depending on the histology. If, if it's a cardiomyopathy, they'll be doing a cardiomyopathy panel. If the heart is normal, they'll do the channelopathy panel. But the big issue is that now they do a broad panel because even with a normal heart, people have mutations. I'm sure Mike will comment on that. You can get mutations in cardiomyopathies, can't you, Mike, when the heart is morphologically, even though I've gone back and looked again, and still find a normal heart because people say you must have missed something if there was a, a pathogenic mutation. So this is a very interesting, about 3% of our SADs turn out to have a, a cardiomyopathy mutation. Can you comment, Mike, on that? 
Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mary, that um, it's that so-called, some of us call it the pre-cardiomyopathic, electropathic presentation of that cardiomyopathy. And Chris Samsarian down under in our program, we're among the first to show, for example, that you can have mutations in PKP2 encoded plaque of villain that Mary would normally see in a heart with overt arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And yet she can look and look and look and the heart is called normal looking. And yet that is the sentinel event of VF. So in the States we kind of do, even though in principle, I think you should order the genetic test based upon the phenotype, what you think is the problem, we now are using the broad panel test to get all of the data for the reasons that Mary um, said, but also from a research standpoint, we then have all of the data. And so we would scrutinize it more carefully. We have all the panel, but if Dr. Shepard told me it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I'm gonna be looking most closely at the known HCM susceptibility genes in that panel and if something comes up in an, a long QT gene in something that in someone in that Mary told me was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I'm more or less gonna be ignoring that long QT supposed variant because that variant's gonna be not pathogenic. A follow-up question to that. If cardiac histology is not specifically mentioned on the autopsy report, should clinicians request that slides be reviewed or call the coroner for more information? Oh, absolutely. In my opinion, everybody who has a sudden cardiac death should have histology. In other words, you just don't look at the heart. You've got to. It's essential. And I emphasize that to every pathologist. Keep some tissue so you can review it. I, I think a, a, an autopsy that's done without histology in these circumstances is almost negligent that they should retain tissue as well as take the genetic material. So yes, phone back or ask, was histology taken and can we review the histology? Very, very important. I get cases every week in which I review histology. Mary, would you comment? Uh, do you think I was being too harsh on the heterogeneity of the autopsy practitioners, or do you agree that the amount of variability among what somebody said the autopsy showed and then what you actually said it showed, yeah. the, the discordance I, is disappointing, wouldn't you say? It is, that particularly when the sampling is so limited. What I always tell pathologists, take at least, I won't bore you with the number, but they sh should take more than one. <laughs> they should take the whole heart but sometimes I get one or two pieces of tissue and that's not sufficient for me to come to a diagnosis. So you're right in the variability. In the UK, even in Europe, as you know, Mike, people who die suddenly don't even have an autopsy. In Germany, for instance, in France, there's almost no autopsies done. People are, the, the, the death is put down as natural without any indicator, even in a 17 year old. So there's tremendous variability. We're trying to level the playing field. It's getting better, as you have said, the same in your clinic, the same with you and Joe. You're sending out the message, and that's the message we send to everybody. Please take, we have a protocol, both nationally and internationally, and even the Society of Cardiovascular Pathology in the United States, Mike, has a protocol for investigation, which says, take material from the heart in all these cases where you've eliminated other causes of death. Okay, the next question is, why isn't there more awareness about working up sudden death cases in the US? It really seems to vary. Yeah, I think it's a great question. The answer is multifactorial. Um, thankfully, sudden death overall is rare. Um, so we're talking about a young person with a one in a hundred thousand person incidence overall. So these tragedies are rare and all the time when you're dealing with uncommon things, uh, there's going to be a variability in awareness and skill set. We get good at things that are common. When things are rare, then you need to go to boutique specialty places 
where that is their thing, like the thing that Dr. Shepard created that's unique in the world. In the United States, it is just variable. And what we're trying to do is get people to do an autopsy when the death is unexplained, get the autopsy. Then second, not just get the autopsy, but get it into the right person's hands with the right eyes and the right brain. Just don't settle for, I always like to have say the joke in the past, our county medical examiner was a coroner and he was a retired ophthalmologist. He had great eyes, but I don't know if he would know what he's looking for in the heart. So we have to get it examined by the right person. And then we have to, we just have work to do. I think we're so much better than what we were two decades ago, but we still have a long way to go. The National Association of Medical Examiners just published a book last year uh, for the evaluation of unexplained pediatric deaths. So a huge effort there. And so progress is being made, but it's just rare things takes a longer time for there to be generalized excellence at it. What do you do if a patient is already deceased with likely SADS condition without available genetics material and family screening is normal? Well, I'll say what we do in the United States and then Dr. Shepard can comment what, what she and Dr. Baer might do at St. George's um, in many ways, we're kind of stuck. So if that autopsy was not done, the death was suspicious, they've already done the right thing to evaluate the living. That doesn't always happen. And that's really important because sometimes the evaluation of the living can reveal the cause of death for the dead um, and make a reasonable conclusion as to why he or she died. Um, but now you've done that evaluation and assuming it was a good comprehensive cardiac evaluation, if there was no phenotype, we may stop there. We may not do genetic testing on the living if there's nothing there to go after. Uh, we might redo the evaluation if that first degree relative was an adolescent or a child and do another one two, three years later uh, to look for evolution of phenotype. Um, but we would sort of keep, I can think of one example, and this is not to suggest the norm, where we've even considered and have done exhuming the body so that we could do DNA testing on the deceased. Because the, the one who died, he or she really holds the secret for the whole family. And it's not unreasonable to explore that. We certainly have gone back to find a, a lock of hair, I can't demonstrate that, but a plug of hair where we could do DNA testing from the hair follicle, not the hair itself, but the plug if it was there and sealed. So we just, you're, you're kind of like CSI, crime scene investigator, where you keep searching and you, you turn over every stone, but sometimes you reach a dead end. Mary, what would you do for that family? Well, similar to you, I mean, if nothing is found, Clinically, you can order genetic testing if there's a clinical indicator for it. But when it's negative, it's not clinically indicated. But as a research tool, Elijah may do it in the families, but purely as a research, not as a diagnostic, as a research tool. And you're right with children because the phenotype may express later, you review them more commonly compared to the older adults. How often do you review, Michael? Do you review every five years? You know, it really depends on the state of the family and how clean that evaluation was and the circumstance, you know, just how suspicious were you and I of the nature of the death. So if it was a 35 year old died suddenly while sleeping and nothing was found in the family, I would say less energetic. If it was a 15 year old who died suddenly while running and no autopsy was done, then you know that, that that second death feels way more genetic than that first death. And so we would probably track that second family uh, more closely uh, than, than, the, than we would the first family. Right. 
Next question is for Dr. Shepard. Why the spleen? Why do you sample the spleen for molecular oh. and genetic testing? Because it's very rich in DNA and it's not contaminated. Blood at autopsy can be contaminated. And getting DNA from the heart or liver, yes, you can. But we find that the quality of the DNA from a small piece of spleen is superior, way superior, and we get very good quality results. That's why we take it. Okay. Can you address the role of modifier genes in the risk of sudden death in channelopathies? Are we actively testing for any such genes? Yeah, I would say that's still very much in the research realm of risk alleles and polygenic risk scores that Connie Bazina in, in uh, the Netherlands has done a, a really a pioneering work uh, uh, with. We have polygenic risk scores or genetic modifiers for Brugada. Uh, syndrome that's advancing, not quite ready for clinical uh, implementation yet. Uh, we have polygenic risk score for the QT, uh, so your long QT plus. Um, John G. DeSessi here at Mayo Clinic, along with Arthur Wilde and his team, uh, we put forward a three prime UTR modifying SNP in the LQT1 gene that has a significant. Uh, impact uh, on on electrocardiographic expressivity, but none of those have advanced to a clinical genetic test. So you're, we have not seen Ambry Genetics or any clinical genetic test company yet have the disease causative gene panel plus the modifier genes uh, implemented yet. I think that's probably realistically five years away from true maturation yet. Would you recommend clinical whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing for sudden cardiac death victims if standard panels are negative? Should this ever be standard of care? Well, I think practically speaking, that's what we are doing on a research realm. And that's what genetic test companies are actually doing. I mean, many of the companies they gather either the entire exome and then they only open up their analytical filter to the known disease genes, whether those are cardiomyopathic or channelopathy, but they have all of the exome. And now we have the entire genome. So we call it the WEMA, the whole exome molecular autopsy. But the I think it's just for obtaining the data. Um, I think there's problems with it in that sometimes the panel test will interrogate the known genes better than the whole exome technology will. So the sensitivity to detect if it's there is better unless they've taken the effort to ensure that suboptimally covered areas are covered better. So I think in the near future, the way we will obtain the data is to do genome sequencing. And then we will selectively open up the analytical filters for what's known. Now, if the known genes are negative, it is a really tall order to invoke a new cause in a new gene in a completely unrelated pathway. And you certainly aren't gonna do that from finding it in the decedent himself or herself there will be a lot of research work to do to prove that that brand new, never before published gene is the reason for that individual's uh, sudden death. Thank you very much. And it looks like we are out of time now. So the speakers have generously agreed to continue answering questions. So we'll compile the questions and answer via email after the webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and thank you very much to all of our speakers and also the SAD Foundation. Also, just a reminder that our next Educate Next webinar will be held on December 2nd and Dr. Katie Thielen will present on Fostering Change, ACMG's New Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.